Here comes another great episode of the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 143. Chad Eubanks, an argument for high fence hunting, timber company deer leases, and Louisiana public hunting. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Morris' Sporting Goods and the Eurohanger. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Dan Kaufman. I shot the uh, Kaufman Buck. You're about to listen to another episode of my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Michael Pitts with Real Tree. I taught Travis T. Bone Turner everything he needs to know about archery. You're tuning in to the most mediocre podcast on iTunes, the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Cameron Cole with the Average Joe Blue Collar Bow Hunter, and you're listening to my number one favorite podcast of all time. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and I am here with you for the next hour or so, as is my good friend and deer hunting accomplice from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. What's happening, my friend? Oh, man, just uh, happy to be here, Jay. Are you? Because I'm psyched that you're with us and the entire contingent of the Big Buck Registry. Yeah, I I wouldn't uh, miss it for the world, brother, and... uh... I enjoy it, and uh, thanks to all the fans that listen to us every week, man. It's uh, much appreciated. It is. I cannot thank you enough for dialing in and pushing play on your Apple phone or your Android today because we have another great show for you, and I sincerely appreciate all the patronage that you give us. Speaking of patronage, if you love this show, would you please leave us a review on iTunes if you're an iTunes user or an Apple user? and subscribe to the show if you've listened. I bumped into a few people recently, so we just subscribed to your show. I would love for you to do that for us right now. And if you wouldn't mind, if you have a couple of bucks extra to donate, and I'm not talking any more than like $1 or $2 a month, if you love the show, we could use the help. Go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate, and all the instructions are right there. Become a patron of the Big Buck Registry. There are different levels, and we actually have some gifts for you if you sign up for the right level. All right, enough of that, Dusty. We have a show today, that uh, a topic we've never discussed, high fence hunting. Should be super interesting, Jay. Off the charts. I think it's gonna change the mindset of some after we hear the story. I have to be honest, I kind of had a negative connotation to it. And I don't think I ever really put any thought into it, except that you look at some of the Facebook posts and the, and there's a lot of negative sentiment. Everybody screams high fence whenever you see a big buck. And certainly there are big bucks living inside of high fences and it's certainly not you know free range. What free range means technically is that everybody gets a shot at this, this deer. And this one fellow that we talked to who has hunted not only the, the lands of free range, the lands of public land hunting in Louisiana, the leased land in Louisiana, but now he's turned to fenced hunting because he, the challenge for him is not so much trying to, and the, the deer hunting is the deer hunting. That's what he has made clear. Like there's still the same challenges, timing the deer, the patterns. If you're, it's not like they just come in to feed. It's no different than than perhaps hunting a piece of leased land where you're, you're you're keeping them in a place where you're feeding them. The difference is, according to Chad, that you're keeping the poachers and the other competition hunters out. So this show may change your mind about that whole aspect, and because it certainly kind of opened up my eyes to some of this this stuff. It's diff- I have a different perspective on this than I ever did. Yeah, uh, right on. It's it's definitely 
set the mind in a different direction on on hunting a f- high fence farm. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have that negative sentiment that I did. I'm not sure. I'm still not sure that it's going to ever be a part of my life here in New Hampshire. Although I think there is a Corbin Park up not too far from me that is technically high fence. Um, so I may go check that out because I can. If you can afford it, I think it could be a different aspect. It could definitely get your kids into hunting when the opportunity may not be there because you're not seeing game. Or if you're a big a big hunter and you, you're you know zoning in on some of these big box and you have a deer shot from out from under you, this this may just be the answer. I don't know. To each his own is basically my perspective on this. Whatever you feel is right is what you should do as long as it's legal then that's what you should do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. It, uh, it, it's definitely going to be an interesting story that you don't want to miss, Jay. I completely agree. But before we get to that, why don't we turn to Jim Keller with this week's Deer News. The Deer News this week is sponsored by the Eurohanger. You don't have to spend big bucks to hang your big buck. Get yourself a Eurohanger. Facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger, E-U-R-O-H-A-N. G-E-R. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story, South Carolina is considering a coyote lottery. This story was originally reported by Alan Clemens on DeerAndDeerHunting.com. South Carolina lawmakers are considering a new tech for coyote predator control. The state is considering tagging several coyotes, releasing them, and offering a bounty for the hunter who kills one of the tagged coyotes. The system would operate much like a lottery system with a tagged coyote earning a reward of $1,000. The South Carolina DNR would tag and release at least 12 coyotes. The bill has already passed House Budget Writing Committee. Although bounties are not a new idea, the catch and release tag idea does add a twist and has the potential to draw more hunting contests and contestants for coyotes. New York trades hunting laws for hunter education. This story comes to us from the Wellsville Daily Reporter. Based on feedback from hunters, New York has decided to not complicate antler restriction laws, but instead educate hunters on the advantages of passing on younger bucks. Instead of mandatory antler restrictions, they are opting for voluntary antler restrictions. The goal is to keep hunting simple and fun with the hopes of drawing even more young hunters. Young hunters will still have the option to take that first buck they get a chance at without feeling bad or risking accidentally breaking a law in the heat of the moment. More seasoned hunters, armed with information about buck development, can pass on small bucks and hold out for that larger buck in future years. New York has taken a very unique approach and it will be interesting to see how it plays out. More deer with CWD in Michigan. Two additional free-ranging deer have tested positive for CWD in Michigan. A nine-month-old male and a three-year-old female deer tested positive for CWD in the core area where previous positive deer had been found. The core area consists of nine townships across two counties. Since May of 2015, just under 5,000 deer have been tested, seven with positive results. The DNR is asking for continued landowner cooperation as efforts are taken to harvest and collect deer for testing. For the complete story, please refer to our show notes or the Detroit News website at DetroitNews.com. Build to lift gun silencer ban moving through Iowa legislature. The story was originally reported by the Quad City Times. A bill to remove the suppressor ban in Iowa is moving through the Iowa legislative process. Iowa is just one of nine states where the use of suppressors or silencers is not permitted. The bill would require anyone purchasing a suppressor to meet federal standards including a background check, fingerprints, a $200 transfer tax, and an application to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. The ban on suppressors was enacted as a response to President Ronald Reagan being shot in March of 1981, even though a suppressor was not used in the shooting. The bill only needs one minor technical amendment and to be signed by the governor. Ohio communities tackle urban deer management with traditional approach. This story comes to us from Fox 8 News in Cleveland. Voters in Northeast Ohio approved allowing bow hunting in all six Cleveland suburbs as a method for controlling their urban deer population. As we have heard many times before, car deer accidents and destructions of habitat and gardens are driving the need for deer population management. The new ordinance passed allows the limited hunting of whitetails by crossbow or longbow by licensed people and allows the use of elevated platforms. The Ohio DNR will work with city leaders to assess the need for additional regulations. Although the selection of bow hunting as the control method used has stirred up some controversy, in general everyone agrees the population needs to be reduced. For additional information about the story, please check our show notes or visit Fox 
bucks8.com. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Chad Eubanks. Chad Eubanks, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Good, guys. How are you doing? Doing quite well. Thanks for asking, man. It's You're uh, you're down in Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. This is my home, Louisiana. Tell us about Louisiana. What's going on in Louisiana right now? I'm, I'm hearing things are not so good down there. It has not been. Uh, we've had a considerable amount of rain over the last week. Um, a lot of people that in the past has not had to deal with with rain or flooding in any type of uh, quantities has you know lost a lot. We've had a couple of fatalities within the state, still battling road closures, bridges being out. So uh, hopefully in the next few days the water is going to subside and people kind of get back to the, the normalcy of life, I guess. Well, that's, that's extremely unfortunate. Louisiana seems to take the brunt of a lot of this this weather stuff. I don't know what, how that happened over the years, but certainly right in that channel of where things hit hard and it's just it not fun. Yeah, so we get it from hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, just seasonal flood, and the occasional ice storm. So we kind of do get it from all directions, you know. Gotcha. So when when you're not getting flooded out, and, and w- what's life like in Louisiana for you? Uh, for myself personally, I work for an insurance company, and uh, that's kind of my day to day grind. I'm a safety consultant for them, so I get to travel really all in North Louisiana. Uh, all of Arkansas over into Texas and have the opportunity during my travel to meet a lot of good, good, interesting people, you know, share, number one, my faith and as well as hunting, um, you know, in, in my day-to-day job. So uh, that's kind of a normal life for me. I have twin boys that's uh, fixing to turn 17, uh, raise them, keeping them involved with school and sports and everything else that goes with being a 17 year old boy sure right keeping keeping them in the woods keeping them keep them hunting keep them active you know just goes back to keeping my kids involved in different things whether it's you know sports uh church activities uh and just being being really cautious of, of who my kids hang out with i know you can only do so much of uh putting the leash on them but uh you know just keeping them in the right channels of people and i've been really fortunate both of them have really good girls that they've been dating you know probably close to a year, both of them, and uh, really good families. They have a good group of friends, you know, football team, powerlifting team, etc. Sure. So, you know, from that aspect, I'm, I'm really fortunate. Uh, gotcha. I don't let them go out and do the, the normal things, I guess, a teenager would do. That, <laughs> you know, getting, like that. getting in trouble, right? Exactly. Well, I try. You know, things things are going to happen. You just sure. you can minimize a lot of it. Uh, depends on how much stress you want to put in your life. But, you right. know, they easily managed, I guess. Yeah. Now, did you grow up in Louisiana? I did. My dad's a minister. I was actually born over in Natchez, Mississippi, which is kind of right on the, the Louisiana line. It's over into Natchez, across the Mississippi River. He was pastoring a church down in that area, and I've been fortunate, I guess, within my life. Uh, I've lived in two or three different towns. My dad, uh, you know, pastored some churches and uh, finished school down in an area called Franklin Parish of Louisiana, which is kind of central Louisiana. Uh, he pastored at a church there for about 22 years. So um, I've really spent all of my life here. Um, I worked for a, a drilling contractor down in south Louisiana. I was a, a training safety consultant for them, spent some time overseas. But most of my, my life has been spent right here in Louisiana, other than the occasional traveling off to a different state to go hunting or visiting friends or, or whatnot, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. And it, it sounds like you're doing well. It sounds like you you got a job, uh, you're raising two, you, two young men, and it uh, sounds like things are going pretty good. Well, it, like again, I've just been I've been blessed and fortunate. So Nice, uh, excellent. Everything's going good so far. All right. Let's talk a little bit about your, your hunting presence. Uh, you've you, you have caught my eye with some of the deer that you submitted to the Big Buck Deer Wall of Fame, of course. And yeah. They're just beautiful deer. And Thanks. you've, I assume, growing up in Louisiana, you've probably, like most hunters do, they start very young. What's your, right. what's your background with hunting? You know, I grew up with my dad hunting. Uh, some church members of ours, we had deer lease over in Mississippi for years, hunted, had a great time, killed some great deer. 
Um, as the years kind of transgressed, you know, landowners was a little getting a little iffy about leasing their land out and things of this nature. And it, it's just kind of again kind of been that onset since I would say the, the early to mid '80s. Um, a lot of private land uh, was just not made available, and it got to where you know the public land kind of come on scene, whether it was a, a state uh, refuge or a national wildlife refuge, and. And hunting there, just having to contend with, you know, a lot of people just inundated with other hunters and uh, really couldn't be selective of spots and trying to get in there. You know, from our aspect of, of up here in north Louisiana anyway, and uh, we just kind of made the, the transition and the shift of going off to, to various places and hunting, you know, looking for a, a better opportunity than really what we had here. You know, Louisiana is a great state for deer hunting. We have a lot of deer hunters. Um, but again, just some of the private land is not available like it used to be. And uh, so we've just always looked for that better opportunity to get in the woods, you know, and stay, in, stay involved. Gotcha. So you, you've had some experience with, with public land hunting and yep. some private land hunting, it sounds like. That's um, right. What was your, your private or excuse me, your public land hunting like? What was your experience with all that? Anything from, you know, just an inundation of people in one, saturated in one area. I mean, it's, you know, when guys spend months and months scouting, especially if it's for a rifle quota hunt, you know, people put in for the draw, and, you know, you may have several hundred, not even thousands of people just drawed, and they start scouting, and, you know, you go select a place, and you got to contend with, you know, if somebody's going to be there uh, hunting in that area, and then it becomes a, a safety issue. You know, a lot of guys or a lot of people, and I, and I hate to say it, but, you know, people just, they'll, they'll shoot at anything sometimes that moves or uh, a lot of times don't take other hunter safety into consideration. And I think that we're seeing more and more of that, um, especially here in Louisiana. I can't speak for a lot of uh, hunting, uh, public hunting areas in other states, but I know here in Louisiana we've, you know, we've had to contend with that over the years. Okay. All right. So... There's the public land hunting in Louisiana, and then there's the private land. And how does that differ for you as a hunter? What does that look like? Well, the private land here, um, majority of the private land that we're going to have either is from a farmer or a landowner, or it can come, uh, the most of it is from timber companies that, you know, harvest pine timber here uh, to put into production for wood, some types of wood products. Um, you know, you can get with a landowner a lot of times if you know them. If, again, you've had to would have to have known them for a while and become friends with them. And you know, they they may let you lease their property out just for hunting rights. And uh, you know, there with that does come some type of, of management, uh, especially here in the northern part of the state. You know, this is kind of big buck country for Louisiana, um, and guys are really selective on what they take. They're really selective on what we feed. Um, our does, we look at our doe numbers. I mean, just the whole gamut of, of managing a deer herd from that perspective. Then you got to contend with, uh, I'm sure, of the other stage, uh, poachers, night hunters, things to, uh, of that nature. Um, and, again, we've had to contend with some of that over the years, which is kind of really what pushed me over to, to go into high-fence hunting areas. Okay. All right. I want to talk about high-fence for sure. Okay. Um well, let's uh, let's talk about just the layout of Louisiana a little okay. bit more. I'm, I'm curious. You you had said that this is the this is the northern part of Louisiana, and that Correct. this is where uh, it sounds like there's more management in the north, according to what you had said. Tell, right. Can you tell me about what the where the dichotomy is there? Is there actually a different influence or thought process the further north you get than in the south? Uh, I wouldn't really say a. a different thought process. We have a lot of good guys that come up from South Louisiana and hunt on some of our National Wildlife Refuges here. Hardcore bow hunters, uh, they get deep in the woods, you know, they go in and find some nice deer. They do a lot of groundwork. Um, and, and they're the guys that, you know, they, they're they looking for that specific deer. They've killed 120s, 130s, 140s, and they're looking for something bigger. Um, and, you know, again, that goes back to a lot of the farms over in the delta or the northeastern part of Louisiana is like that, it, and it attracts um, those type of hunters. Um, we have a lot of people from all over 
from numerous states that has camps over in Tinsall Parish, which is over in the eastern part of Louisiana. Um, they'll come over and they'll hunt the uh, Tinsall National Wildlife Refuge. It's, it's known for good deer. We've had several state records that's come out uh, from over in that area. It uh, just has a really good uh, ecosystem over there for deer and uh, other, other forms of wildlife as well. Hmm. Okay. All right, so it's not so much the, I mean, you have, full, the philosophy of deer management is is wide throughout the, the states. What's different about the north in particular? Uh, from north Louisiana, what's different? Yeah. You know, what we see over in the north uh, part of the, the state, um, typically we're going to have bigger body deer just due to the forage that they have. Okay. Uh, typically we're going to see uh, bigger mass on the deer over in that uh, particular area. Again, it's all it's a lot of agricultural fields. It's really thick, swampy type areas there. So it's it's got the ab- habitat for those older bucks to mature and get some age on them. Uh, if you start shifting over to the central part of the state, over towards you know the western part of the state, state and even on down in South Louisiana, um, you do have some agriculture uh, in those other areas, but it's it's not the same type of agriculture is here. You get into more sugar cane and cotton and, and things that really deer's not going to eat. Okay. Um, so they just rely on natural natural forests, where, whether it be, you know, just natural browse or acorns or whatever the case may be. Um, and from my experience down south, it does have a higher population of deer, and they're not afforded the time to mature. Um, you know, we have a pretty high limit uh, annual limit here in Louisiana of six deer, and you know, mm. uh, some people wants to take their six deer. You know, and and I guess that's kind of the difference between uh, most of our hunters here in the state. You've got guys just going to go out for meat, and you got that large majority of people that's looking for for trophy animals only. And if that means traveling out of state to adjacent states, whatever the case may be, that's what those guys is going to do because that's what they're looking for. Gotcha. All right. So it's safe to say that the northern region where, where you live, correct? Correct. What, there's more agriculture, better feed for the whitetail, basically. Correct. Okay. You know, anything from soybeans, corns, milo, wheat, winter ryegrass, winter wheat, things of that nature. Um, you know, we have a, a large portion of that up here in the northern I'd say from central Louisiana around Alexandria, which would be a good focal point on the map, uh, north of the state line, and then everything that lies pretty much east over to the Mississippi River. That's all a high concentration of, of agricultural farmland. Okay. Is the majority of your hunting in Louisiana done on private land? Majority is now. And I would, if I had to throw a number at you, I'd say probably 70, 30, 70 percent. Um, leased land, whether it be private land or from timber companies, and 30% uh, probably on our, our public lands. Okay. You brought up an interesting point. We ha- we see this up here in the north, too. Um, Dusty, I'm not sure if this applies to Ohio or not, but you talked about timber companies. Um, how much of Louisiana is timber land that is actually being managed? Managed for deer? Is that, is that- oh, just managed uh, for timber. Oh, Lord, uh, you know, I, probably 60% of the, of the land in okay. North Louisiana is, is managed, and we're talking about pine timber. Pine so timber, we, okay. We have, a, you know, there is some areas out in Mississippi and Missouri and other places that, that has big tracts of uh, hardwoods, and that's certainly a marketable item now, and, and people is managing that. But here it's specifically Mostly t- pine. pine. Mostly pine, okay. Exactly. So it's it's... If that's private land, how do you go about getting permission to hunt on these private pieces from the timber companies? Is it well, there's, there's two ways here. One, um, as the land become available through some of the national uh, timber companies that's operating here, those tracts of land will be made available on their lease or their website under their leases, and you can go on there and you can actually – purchase that lease for the year. Hmm. Um, there is some timber companies that have actually a bidding process. You look at a track of land and, you know, you'll have a certain date everybody puts in a sealed bid and they kind of take the highest bidder. There has been some changes within the last year to two 
of some ownerships of, of timber companies, uh, and some of that is changing. And I'm, n I'm not really abreast of, of how it's working now, but that's kind of how it's worked in the past for us here. Okay. And the do they cut up or cut up the pieces of land so that you can pick which piece you want to bid on type of thing? Like just draw, well, draw a line on the map and say, All right, that's the piece I want. They do somewhat. You know, they may have a 200-acre track over here, and they'll lease the whole thing Okay. Uh, as one unit. They may have several thousand acres in another location where they'll actually bust it up in several sections to make it affordable for leasees to come out and take advantage of that. Gotcha. And how much are you talking about when you're looking at a, a lease property in that style? Oh, man. It just, it just depends. I leased some property in South Arkansas back in... Uh, early 2000s, I want to say it was around 800 acres, and you're looking at 4,500 to 5,000 is what I paid for it then. Okay. So. And that, that runs for the season? Yeah, that's for the season. Just the deer season kind of thing? It, well, it, actually year-round. Year-round. Okay, that's the year. Round, so. That's right. So it's a year lease somewhere around $4,500. So is the price comparable in Louisiana to some of those things for like for an 800-acre piece? Yeah, that, that's pretty much what it is. Okay. It's here and it's pretty comparable. Uh, it it goes, you know, depending on the, the area you're in. If it's an area that that has higher deer concentrations, or if it's been in a long term lease managed or things of that nature, the price per acre may be a little higher on the lease end. Um, you know, there's just several several factors into it. Okay. All right. And is the competition stiff? I mean, are you going up against all your hunting buddies to to see who's gonna? get this piece of property or, or do you focus on uh if let's say there's a tremendous whitetail walking around in a certain piece does that draw more attention how does that all get sorted out as far as when somebody's trying to lease the property once it's leased and you're dealing with individual members well let's let's talk about the just let's say you get a, a piece of property and you actually get the lease do you okay. then divide it up amongst your buddies um, well, you know, a lot of guys would go lease, a, a, you know, like I did. I, I went and leased a fairly small track of land, and it was just for my family. You know, okay. my kids, my dad, et cetera. Okay. Uh, but, because that's what you run into, no matter how much you try try to manage a piece of property sometimes. You know, if you start saying, well, look, you know, I saw a nice deer over here, you know, word travels like wildfire. And I'm sure it's that way in all other states. You know, right. I've, I've hunted pretty much all over the country, and I've heard horror stories. But Yeah. Uh, it happens. Okay. So a lot of times, or it sounds like if you get a piece that's holding what you believe to be a, a, a record or state record whitetail, that piece might go for more lease exactly. money because the bid's going to be higher. If it's been managed, if it's got a campsite on it, if it has existing stands, you know, the temper companies look at it and say, okay, well, we need to, you know, raise the rate on this particular piece of property. So, um, Very happens. interesting. Okay. It happens. Yeah, very neat. So you do hunt in other spots, and we started to talk a little bit about high fence hunting. And this this is a topic is like it's a hot button amongst hunters, this high fence thing, because some hunters love it and other hunters just don't respect it at all. Right. And it's I don't know why that is because I personally I think it is it is to yourself what you want it to be. It's whatever right. you make it. And yes, each style of hunting is just entirely up to the hunter, not up to the other hunters to decide what the other hunter should do. It's, it's up to the hunter. Yes, sir. Period. So tell me about this. And, and Dusty, I want you to kind of get in on this conversation because we've been wanting to talk about this high fence thing for a while. We, have, we haven't done a high fence show. And certainly this isn't all high fence that we're talking about here. But I really wanted we, – we haven't interviewed somebody that's actually done a high fence hunt but I want to get into this because it's it's fascinating to me. It it I mean obviously it holds bigger deer, but yeah. What I want good. You know it's something that that uh, man you just you you see so much trash talk about a high fence operation, right? But, but yet in, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking they're raising some of the most best uh, antler growth I've ever seen on a high fence place. Uh, you know that that's that's what sparks my interest is the to talk about the uh, the the programs that they run as far as antler growth uh, and and get into 
habitat and that kind of stuff on a high fence operation. I, I know it's got to be phenomenal because there's phenomenal deer that's harvested there. Right. So tell me, uh, Chad, how did you get into high fence hunting in the first place? You've hunted public. You've had private leases, none of which have fences. What drew you to this? Well, you know, just you. everybody's kind of heard the stories over their lifetime. You know, man, I saw a nice buck down here at my favorite hunting spot getting great pictures of him, most of them's at night. And you have guys that just hunt these places weeks and months and months to come up empty-handed at the end of the year with a, with a pretty sizable investment, feeding, going back and forth to a hunting location, only to hear that another landowner has either shot the deer, somebody's run over the deer, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, several years ago, I... I wanted to take my kids hunting, and, you know, here in Louisiana, you you can hunt and you can kill some nice deer. It may, it may take you a few years, you know, of getting into the groove and really locating a nice deer and keeping an eye on him. And uh, I wanted to take my kids and, and just kind of do something different for them, uh, keep them in hunting, keep them kind of enticed into being in the field. So I decided we would go to Texas and uh, met with a really nice guy, went over on a hunt over there, uh, my kids was able to kill. We killed a red stag. Uh, one of my kids killed a, a nice fallow in, a, in a, a gold record round. And, you know, that just kind of put the hook in their mouth. They, they Coming from Louisiana and even in South Arkansas, where we've done a lot of hunting, you know, going and sitting on the stand some days and, and seeing one or two, maybe some does or some little young bucks to go into these places and really seeing some mature deer seeing numbers of deer, and being able to be selective of what you want to shoot. You know, we try to shoot four- or five-year-old deer, something that's matured, something that's reached um, that, I'm not saying pink in antler growth, but something, something that has certainly matured uh, to a, a sizable, you know, animal to take. And, um, and that's really has what has gotten me and, and pushed me into to hunting in a high-fenced area you know, with the experience of hunting these places, you know, these people have a big investment in these animals. Um, not only of buying uh, deer or other exotics to get started, but feeding, uh, feeding the deer. Um, a lot of people worm their deer just like they would cattle several times a year and um, really taking, taking the time uh, to manage their animals um, and being selective. Interesting. Okay. But so- I, do, I do want to nip some of the... Um, I guess some of the misconceptions, the bad impressions that people have got over the years of high fence places, because I was one of them at one time. Yeah, and let's get into I that. Started going to these ranches, and, and I've got ties with some of the biggest ranches out in Texas, and, and have become really good friends um, with the people out there. A lot of the people that you know is condoning high fence ranches has never been. It's just. They, they've heard their buddy or, or maybe a family member say something bad about it, and they just assume, man, this is the worst thing in the world. And I'm not saying all, all high-fence hunting areas is the best in the world, just not like I'm not saying any state is better than any other for deer hunting. I think they all have their pros, and I think they have their cons. And um, we've got a lot of people that's not so animal-friendly friendly in the world that's really kind of pushed a lot of the negativity, whether it's in a private uh, high fence place or even out on public or private land. You know, it's just we seem like we get bombarded with that uh, repeatedly. But, you know, I just encourage people, if they've never been to a high fence hunting operation, go. You don't have to go out there to hunt. A lot of, a lot of the people let you come out. You may fish in their pond. You can stay. You can look around. Um tour it, whatever you want to do, but, you know, go out with an open mind and, and look around for yourself. A lot of these farms are laid out. It's not just like an open pasture where you're going to walk out and you're going to see multitudes of deer or animal and you just sit there and pick whatever you want. Or it's, it's not a pen where these animals are, are kept at till the hunter shows up and the gates open for the animal to come out. You know, it's, it's, I want to squash a lot of that negativity. A lot of these ranches and farms that's high fenced are laid out where it's very challenging. I mean, this past year, we had a deer on camera at one of our places. We hunted for hunted for three days. I was over and we didn't see the deer. Hmm. Um, it's just like any other place. You've got some some really thick, rugged terrain on some of these places 
and, and these deer get at them, and you're just not going to see them. That's interesting. All right, so you're you're bringing up points that are that are the deer hunting is deer hunting in in many aspects. It's not right. It's the deer you can go hunt and not uh, and have plenty of deer around, but you won't see the deer that you had on camera for four weeks for the three days you hunted on public on lease land. Right. Or in this case, high fence. It, it, there, there are similarities there. Which, it, it very much is. You know, just this past year, I've got some good friends that have some outdoor shows here in Louisiana. It's got some private land in South Louisiana, and they've been dealing with poachers. Right. Uh, you know, have cameras set up, all of a sudden get an alert on their camera that's it's taking a picture, and here's these guys out, you know, whether it's hogs, deer, whatever the case may be. And I think everybody that's hunted has dealt with some shape, form, or fashion of trespassing or poaching, whether it's been killing animals, whether it's been stealing stands, equipment, etc. I mean, I think everybody's dealt with it. Right. And you're seeing more and more places, again, that is becoming high-fence operations, and they may not be selling hunts to the average, everyday individual to come hunt. It may be for their own personal use, for corporations or family, whatever the case may sure. be, because of the money that, over time, well, they see it's just, it's, it's been a waste, you know, it's been in vain. Uh, but you just can't manage it. In a lot of aspects, you cannot manage uh, your deer, your equipment, anything else. Uh, in low fence operations, like you can high fence operations. And that's just kind of the, the uh, moral of the story on that that's aspect of it, you know. Let's talk about the difference between the, the high fence and the low fence. What is the difference? Genetics. Um, you know, Raising deer, raising exotics is no different than raising any other type of cattle or horses. You know, people that in those operations invest a, a considerable amount of capital to get started. Number one, you've got to acquire your land. Number two, you've got to spend a considerable amount of capital getting it fenced in, and that's, that's not cheap. Um, if anybody's ever even tried to put up barbed wire or some other type of fencing for, for horses or cattle, they'll understand. But... You know, and once that's done, then you have to decide what genetics you're going to put on your place. Um, there's certainly state laws and regulations that's required. Uh, you got to get set up as uh, whether you're a breeding facility and or whatever the case may be. So there's there's a lot of regulatory requirements associated with it. Um, and then once the, the genetics are on the place, then you know you become selective. Uh, you've got to manage your Number one, you got a carrying capacity on your property. You know, how many bucks to does. All of that has to come out to a, a fine balancing equation uh, for it to work. Gotcha. So does it, is it safe to say that the high fence or the fence period is not only to keep the deer in, but it's to keep the other hunters and poachers out? You're exactly right. Okay. You're, that's, I couldn't put it any better myself. I'm assuming that there's still poacher danger there right am i correct it is and it depends on the layout of your property um i got a, a buddy of mine that's got a, a, a ranch one of the premier ranches in texas and he's got about six miles of i-10 frontage that borders the southern part of his ranch um he's lucky in the aspect of he has cedar trees that grows all the way down the interstate that kind of bear puts, provides that barrier between the interstate and his ranch but you know with anything else, and people find out you have a ranch, yeah, people try to come up, they try to cut your fence. We've had it happen here in Louisiana. There's several hunting preserves here. Um, there's been some monster deer. People just ride down the road, see them, they shoot them, or they go cut their fence, and they go in and hunting. So, yes, it is. We we deal, still have to deal with that as well. Right, gotcha. Exactly right. We still have predator issues, just like uh, public land or private land. Uh, Stuff's going to get under your fence. You still got to go out and, and monitor that and, and manage that problem as well. But you can control it, especially on the, the hog side of things. You can control that a little bit better um, than open land. Okay. How many acres usually comprise, or minimum, what's the minimum number of acres that you need to create a, a high fence area? You know, it really depends on the layout of the land. Um, where my place is up in Missouri, we're at a little over 600 acres, 620 some odd acres. Okay. Um, it's rolling hills, creeks, um, 
very thick cover with cedars. Um, we have some oak flats in there. It's just kind of it's it's a variety uh, of timber. Uh, or layout, topography of land. Over in Texas, you know, it's kind of different. You have some places that's really flat, more like a pasture-type setting um, with strips of timber in it. Some is, is very hilly, very rocky in, in nature with some creeks and water structure in it. Um, ridge lines um, do kind of run into the problem in some of those areas of finding cover for the, for the animals, and that becomes a problem depending on what type of animal you have in your place. But Going back to the question you asked me as far as the number of acres, you know, over the years I have known known guys that's had 100 acres fenced in and conducted hunts on, and, you know, there's guys that's got 15 or 20 acres, uh, 20,000 acres, I'm sorry, um, to conduct hunts okay. on. So it really kind of depends on, on what their business plan is, their strategy is, and, you know, the layout of their property and, and what they have in mind of doing with their animals. Gotcha. And as far as the the fence itself, how many how many miles of fence do you have to maintain? <laughs> I would have to do a count on the property I just acquired up in Missouri. Um, you're talking miles of fencing, right? Five miles, ten miles, fifteen miles. Again, depending on the size of your property, and and some of the you know the the some of the land you can't just go out and drive a post and put your fence up you know like out in texas you're dealing with rock and limestone and various things you have to actually drill down to be able to put your post in place to to hang your wire on so it becomes a very expensive uh, endeavor from that aspect of getting it off the ground right do you, do you know the cost of what it what it costs to put up high fence like that you're you're looking at several hundred dollars sometimes a foot, depending on what kind of wire you use, what kind of post you use in bracing. A lot of the ranches now you're seeing more and more that's what's called double fenced. Um, most of your high fence places is going to have 10 feet, 10 foot of wire, but it's going to actually have uh, two layers to prevent stuff from getting out, especially as you start getting into bigger animals such as elk or stag or things of that nature. Um, you just don't want to run the risk of those types of animals getting getting out. Um, so it can be on upwards of several hundred dollars a foot up to into the thousands, again, just depending on what type of fence you're putting up and how you're going about doing wow. it. But, so there's automatically a large expense that goes very, with this thing. Very much so. That was a guy in Texas uh, that I hunted with some. He had 100 acres. He done everything himself. He bought his wire, and he was at about fifteen grand for his hundred acres, in which I don't think is very bad. But you know, he probably purchased it from somebody new and, and got a, a pretty good deal on it. So that just kind of gives you a, a guesstimate of, of what he had in his place for hundred acres. Okay, right. you're talking two hundred fifty dollars a foot. You know, you put a thousand foot of fence up, that's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Exactly. Okay. Well, I mean, some of these farms, you know, even small farms, they have half a million dollars, three quarters of a million dollars just in fencing, and some even more, again, depending on the size of okay. it. So unless you're a multimillionaire or a billionaire that can just <laughs> keep this as a recreational uh, event for you or whoever you want to bring with you or, right. or a company that might own this, I don't know. There's a business aspect to this that has to be maintained because you can't. You have to have revenue coming in to support exactly. the the cost of maintaining this thing. You, you operate off a profit margin just like any other type. Sure. Of business. Yeah, it's a business. Exactly. So how um, how do you do that? Do you is it simply by hunts coming in, people come to pay or come there to and pay to be there kind of thing? It does. I mean, a lot of a lot of places uh, do different things. You have some farms that will actually lease out. Some pasture land uh, for for individuals to to harvest hay off of. Sometimes you'll have I've got some friends that lives up in Indiana. They lease out part of their uh, hunting preserve for a row crop farmer. Um, there's a lot of a lot of us guys out there that do have sponsorships that that furnish uh, some type of some equipment for us um, for advertising certain purposes, but. Uh, but yeah, there, you know, there's just different. Um, Interesting. So I, different operational, I guess. Uh, different. Types. Sounds like there are multiple streams of revenue that You're could right. be produced, like any piece of land could produce. Exactly. That's right. 
And, and, and the difference is, you know, like, and again, I want to speak for Louisiana specifically because I've hunted here more than anywhere else. If you go out and you lease a piece of property, let's say from a timber company, it is a business operation of harvesting and managing timber. That's their first and foremost priority. Hunting is a secondary revenue stream for that company. So if you've got a $2,000 or $3,000 box stand put up and a nice feeder and you've worked your butt off clearing lanes, planting food plots, if it's time for that timber to be harvested, they don't stop and say, well, man, you know, this hunter's got a big investment already in this little area. We're not going to cut timber during deer season. They don't care. They need their timber. So, so many guys that showed up one day at their favorite hunting club to find out that the 200 acres surrounding their deer stand has just been cut to the dirt. Gotcha. So, yep. I get you. Same type of operation, just on a bigger scale. Uh, sure. On a, excuse me, a different type of scale. Right. And, and you brought up an interesting point. I never really, it never dawned on me that that you could actually use the land for other things than hunting to produce revenue streams. Dusty, you can attest to this, being in the farming industry, that land can produce lots of dollars in revenue if you get it out to the right people. Oh, Fine. yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, I mean, I understand that, you know, even just, just because you got a fenced-in area, that if you got uh, row crop ground that's fenced in with that, why wouldn't you rent it out for, for rent, you know? Yeah, you're killing two birds at one stone. You're feeding your deer, and you're also, you know, the, the farmer's... Uh, being able to, to harvest that, that crop and you'd certainly make a revenue on it himself. Sure, right. Oh, gotcha. Very now, on this place I got in Missouri, we've got, you know, we've, we've got cattle grazing on it right now. We've got several large pastures uh, that's been seeded in grass, and we've got cattle grazing on it right now. And um, so it, it's a win-win for everybody. Gotcha. So the, the, the pay to play as a hunter, though, it does come in, into – aspect here this is a, a piece of the puzzle correct all right and and how do you end up pricing that out like if you wanted to go do that what to you as somebody that has hunted in these places now owns one how do you decide whether it's a good price bad price or or in between for the property is that what you're saying yeah okay. yeah if you're if you're trying to evaluate i want to go look at a high fence hunting excursion but I want to try to figure out where I want to go, and I want the best bang for the buck. And how do you, as a hunter who's done this before, how do you evaluate that? From a hunting standpoint, you know, it's, it's like going to a, a car lot and seeing where you can get the best price. Uh, because in, this, in the hunting industry, whether you're hunting out in, in private land or even in a, a hunting preserve, a high-fenced area, um, it kind of depends on, on what's on the property, how it's laid out. Somebody may have a big lodge. Um, a lot of times hunters are paying for that um, added luxury, so to speak, while they're there. Um, a lot of those things come into play. What type of animals are on the property? Um, how is the property managed? You know, a lot, of these, a lot of these, even a smaller operation, just from a feed aspect alone, you can be talking twenty to $30,000 a year just in feed. Right. Feeding your animals. Sure. Yeah. Of course. So right. All of that comes into comes into play. Um, okay. We use we use um, as far as buying our animals. We use uh, established breeders, established farms um, that breed these animals. They have a a long track record of disease free animals. They are licensed. A lot of them are licensed with the USDA. Certainly, the state that they operate in, and. Um, we just develop a business relationship with those individuals, and that's that's where we get our our, our animals from. Gotcha. Very very interesting. I, it's uh, it's just just a whole other aspect. Um, so the you've, the place that you now own um, was a place that you were a client of prior to that. Back, this the place that I re recently acquired was a hunting operation for a number of years. The people that own the place are large farmers. They have a lot of cattle, they have a lot of row crops, they're in, into other types of businesses, and they have become older over the years, like we all have, and it's just one of those things. We've got to focus either on farming or hunting. We can't do it all anymore. And it was just a decision in their business plan that this is one thing that they didn't want to pursue anymore. The opportunity made itself available for me to, to go up there and 
Um, the place hadn't been hunted in several years, and uh, I was talking to the to the landowners, and they had been seeing some good deer. No cameras has even been out on the place. So I said, you know, I just want to come up there for two or three days, kind of see what you got on the place and, and see what I can connect with. And that's kind of where the whole... Uh, the interest, I guess, accelerated in in this area. Okay. Now, you had hunted this place before? Yes, that's a deer that, that I shared with you guys you shared, earlier. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. So this this place hadn't been really tapped into in quite a while. You got an opportunity to hunt it before you you ended up investing in it. Correct. Fascinating. So, I was not, you know, we knew there was, they had a deer herd on there. It's a closed herd. You know, the place has been in business you know, in operation, I guess, 15-plus years. So we knew there was deer there, but, again, it had not been hunted in three or, or so years. And uh, I just wanted to kind of get out uh, get out in the in the woods a little bit and just see what it was all about yeah. and see what was going on. Very interesting. So what I'm interested in, Chad, or in Chad, is kind of how you go about setting up your hunt. I want to bring Dusty in here to kind of go through, right. like, a gear check and how you, how you prepare – Maybe it's different than hunting on public or private, or I don't know. But I'm I'm curious to see what what kind of things you you prepare for and the things you you actually use. What kind of uh, equipment and tools you use to do this hunt? So, Dusty, take it away. Yeah, uh, Chad, do you carry a backpack with you when you go on a high fence hunt? You know, I've got a, a backpack that I've had for a number of years, and I do carry some items in it. You know, I'm kind of different. Um, now that with this hunting preserve and hunting high fence places as a hunter going a field i guess that's out on private land you know typically that hunter is going to take a gear bag and, and all kind of accessories and pretty much we're, we're a simplistic operation and most of these farms are you know we, we will carry a thermosail we will carry you know something that has some type of snack items in it for our clients or, or even for hun other hunters but mostly when we go a field it's you know the necessities, our rifle, our ammunition, and good optics. Um, and that's pretty much what we use. Um, as far as camouflage and things of that nature, it, yes, it does come into play. A lot of times for a rifle hunter, they're going to be hunting out of a shooting house or some type of blind. Um, I have people come all the time, and, and I've hunted with people. They may wear some type of black attire, such as Under Armour or something that's... Uh, just black in color. You can't see that setting in a blind. You know, that animal can't see that. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we really don't have to uh, get geared up towards, from a, a camouflage standpoint, traditional camouflage standpoint, per se, I guess. Yeah, it makes sense that uh, being all blacked out in the, in the shooting house would uh, conceal you. So, yeah. what do you, what do you focus on scent control while you're in there? Do you do anything for scent control? You know, we do. I use some dead downwind um, scent that we've used for a number of years, and that has seemed to to work the best for me. Um, and again, that is for from personal experience. I have some laundry uh, detergent that that I use, and I also have some scent spray prior to going into in the field because it's like anything else. Even though that you're hunting in a high fenced area, um, these deer are not used to people. Even though that we go out and we do fill up feeders. We shy away of getting the animals used to people, and, and that comes a lot of times from deer that's raised maybe at a breeding facility from a young age, and they're around humans so much. So in most of your hunting preserves, your larger ranches, it, it's kind of opposite. You know, the deer are just like they are in the wild. Scent control is a big thing. You may be sitting in a stand, you may have a north wind blowing, and all of a sudden it's, it's switching a different direction or swirling. So guess what? Those deer, just like anywhere else, they're going to smell you and, and you'll never see them. So we're certainly uh, very cautious, and that's probably the biggest thing that we look for and, and try to achieve is controlling our scent, not only in the stand, but to and from as well. Right, for sure. What kind of shooting houses are you talking that you use? We've got some blinds that's actually built right now um, that we're finishing up. We've got some 12 by 6 shooting houses. They're made out of a, a fiberglass or a composite material. This is just something that we have fabricated up ourselves. Um, they have sliding windows in them. They're insulated. We've got some uh, propane heaters inside for people to keep warm. Um, we've got some nice shooting rests all the way around, some nice chairs, office-type chairs inside. 
Um, we are in negotiations with a major stand manufacturer of uh, getting some stands out for the property, and, and hopefully that will come to fruition uh, before hunting season comes back around this year. But. Gotcha. Okay. What uh, When you say you, you rifle hunt, what kind of rifle are you using? I shoot a Remington. <clears throat> right now I've got an Alaskan, Alaskan Wilderness 300 Remington Ultra Mag, and that is my go-to gun. No matter where I'm hunting, whether it's in Louisiana, whether I'm in Texas, or if I decided to go to Colorado to shoot an elk or on one of our places to shoot an elk, uh, that's the gun I use. Especially with the new types of ammunition they have out now that's, you know, different power levels, there, there is a round for that 300 Remington Ultra Magnum for anything you want to shoot. Gotcha. When, uh, when, you, when you talk about the shooting houses, how, how many shooting houses do you have on a one particular ranch? On our place up in Missouri, we have three on it right now. And those shooting houses, we are, this year, coming into operation, we're going to video all of the hunts. As a client comes in, we're going to video their hunt. We're going to give them a copy of that CD to take home with them, and they'll have that to, to reflect back on and cherish for, year, cherish for years to come. Uh, our shooting house right now can hold three people, three hunters. It's designed for three hunters. Plus, we've got extra room that's in a place designed that's for the camera so we can film those hunts as well. Uh, very nice. Okay. Very, very cool. Very cool. So, Chad, I was wondering if you could take us on, on a hunt, uh, your most memorable hunt, the, specifically this one, the deer that you sent into the Big Buck podcast for the, the okay. wall. Could you take us on a play-by-play -play hunt and how that all unfolded? I'm curious to see kind of how that would have compared to a hunt anywhere else. Sure. Uh, the particular deer that I submitted to y'all, the, the farmer or the owner of the, of the property that I actually just acquired up in Missouri had saw this deer one afternoon in a field. And he called me and said, look, man, he said, this deer that I saw this afternoon was probably one of the biggest deer I've seen in a while, and it just don't look familiar. It's not a deer that he's picked up previously on cameras or, or even seen, you know, out and about in his day-to-day -day operations of, of tending to the cattle and the farm. And I'd already had plans to come actually a couple weekends after I received this phone call, so I, <laughs> I pushed my date back a little bit and, and left. I wanted to go see what was going on and, and wanted to put my eyes on this deer. So he told me that the, pretty much the location <clears throat> that he had seen the deer in, and there was no blinds, there was no stand, there was nothing in that part of the hunting preserve. Um, it was the thickest part. Uh, this deer had, had, I guess, had come out. When he saw him, was was probably cruising for some does. So I said, look, man, I've got a climbing stand at the house. I'm just going to take my climbing stand and I'm going to go get in where he's at. I was assuming that was probably his bedding area. Looked at the top, uh, topographic map of the place. Um, had a nice water source down through there. Some thick cover for the deer. Um, so I just wanted to kind of pinpoint that and, and see if that's really where his home was at. So showed up to the place. Got there late one afternoon. I didn't even worry about going out and hanging my stand. Uh, and I didn't want to fool with it the next morning when I woke up. So I said, I'm just going to go out. I'm going to get on top of this ridge. It kind of looks da looks down in a creek bottom uh, that's really thick with forage and cover, uh, a lot of cedar down in the bottom. So I just uh, went out and got up on the side of the hill and, and watched some deer playing out in the field. I was kind of at a vantage point where they couldn't see me. I was kind of hit. I was recessed in the, in the wood line, but, you know, there was animals out in the field playing and, uh, of course, we was overlooking this bedding area, and um, two days, I'm, I'll make a, a long story short, two days of hunting, uh, I didn't see the deer that the, the guy had explained to me, so I wanted to hold out. We saw some really nice deer, saw some from, you know, 130s to all the way up to 160, 170 class deer, um, and from what the owner had described to me, he figured this deer would go from 220 to 230 inches, so... Uh, just wanted to hang out and be patient. So the last day there, I went out that morning, it was raining. The last day I was there, um, and, and a cool front was coming in. So I went out, got in the same spot, and I'd already hung a, a ladder stand in this place. And what I had actually done was moved on the back side of this bedding area that overlooked another field um, where I, we were seeing, as time transpired when I was there, we were seeing more and more activity. 
So I got there that morning, hunted, didn't see anything. Um, kind of, it, it almost made up my mind I was done. You know, I had a long drive back to Louisiana, and man, it was freezing cold. I said, look, I'm going to hunt one more afternoon, see what we can do. So I didn't go and get into the stand about an hour before dark that last day that I was there. And I uh, had sat there, and I'd been fumbling on my phone a little bit, texting my kids, Facebook, whatever the case may be. And, and all of a sudden, just heard a lot of racking, looking it was some does coming through the woods. But I could tell something was either spooked them or something was after them because they, they just was not acting normal. What They just wasn't cruising or trolling through the woods. So uh, when I looked up, it was actually another deer that was following those does. Um, and then all of a sudden I heard a snort wheeze, and I said, uh-oh, we got something going on. And about the, that time, the deer that I actually ended up taking come out and run that the buck off that was following the does. Mm. And uh, he didn't want anybody in his area. And when that other buck come in and encroached on his does, that's when he showed himself. And uh, we got a shot at him. He was about 75 yards. He'd come out into the edge of the field right at dusky dark chasing those does. It actually come up a draw in a pinch that come out in, into the field and push those does out into the field, and we got a good shot on him. So he scored 248, and uh, we, we were certainly pleased with him. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, and listening to you tell the story, and Dusty, tell me if you agree with this, I couldn't tell the difference between a story and a high fenced area versus a place that was in a, a private piece of property or even a public land for the most part, other than there's no story about another hunter that you might've bumped into. Exactly. Right? And, and that's what I want other, other hunters to, to understand. We have just the same difficulties in, in, in different areas, I guess, as, as hunters hunting out in, in private or public land. Typically, when we go out, we know a certain deer that we're going for, and we want to get on that deer. And it's not that simple as getting in a truck and riding through a few fields and, oh, there he is. You know, when you get a, a four-, five-, six-year-old mature buck, he didn't get that age from being stupid. Um, right. They're cautious. Um, they use the, the does for decoys. They use the young bucks for decoys, and they just lay tight. And especially on good years where well, we've got acre crops on a lot of these these farms and hunting locations, you know, they're going to hang tight in, in those bedding areas, cruising and eating, eating on these acorns, and, and even really in hard rut, they'll get their hair on the does, they'll get them off down in the pinch somewhere, and uh, that's where they're going to keep them. That's fascinating, just to hear that, you know, it's whitetail is whitetail, it doesn't matter if they're that's inside right. the fence or outside the fence, the only difference is you don't have to compete with other hunters. That's, that's exactly right, that's, and, that's, and again... I want other hunters to realize that. Uh, some, some guys that has never been out on a high, a high fence place. Take your kid. If you've got a kid that you're trying to get into the sport of hunting, there's no better place to start that kid off is to go into uh, a ranch out in Texas, come to our place up in Missouri. You know, a child is going to see a lot of different animals. It's going to keep their attention. Um, and if you want to get them addicted, you want to get them into hunting, I don't know of any better place. That's how I started my kids, and it's and it's kind of it's kind of spoiled them in a sense. They don't see the number of deer out in, in you know on public land, I guess, or even I don't know lease somewhere. But. Well, you certainly raised some very very good points. I have to say that's uh, those are all very good aspects as to uh, it's a strong argument for a high fence is to get your kids involved, get them hooked uh, with that that first hunt, that first kill. The, right. Th then they'll be in it for life, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it'll, certainly, it'll certainly keep their attention. There's nothing worse than having a, uh, a child and maybe the first or second time out on a deer stand in 30-degree in weather or 20-degree weather with snowing or wind chill factor down in the teens on your kid not seeing anything or not seeing anything that you're going to shoot. Uh, you know, it, it kind of... Puts a bad taste in kids' right, mouths. Right. Like that. So, I agree. And the only thing is that you can't put it in the record books. That's the only other conclusion of this, can. right? You can. SCI. Really? Okay. So there is one that will take these. So you're not you're not ruled out of all all books, just some. Exactly. Right. Yeah, Boone and Crockett, yeah. Um, and even Pope and Young. And I'm not real up to breast on the Pope and Young stuff. 
Um, I know in the high fence, everything, the places I'm involved in, everybody's into SCI. Okay. All right. Very nice. So there is a, there is a book for exactly. man sure is. like that. Okay. Chad, I have 10 rapid fire questions for you. Go. And all right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Number one hunting tip? Yep. Man, it's got to be scent. I am a big scent freak. Um, I think that is the most important aspect of hunting, whether you're in a high fence place, out on a free range hunt, scent control, scent control, scent control. Okay, scent control. That's a very important one for sure. All right, we all have these things that we've got to have with us at all times when we're hunting. And it's usually like a good luck charm of some sort, and we feel completely naked in the blind or in the stand <laughs> if we don't have it with us. What's that one thing for you? Range finder. Range finder, all right. So that, that kind of, you know, we've evolved with technology, but I started using one probably five or six years ago. And it's kind of like walking out of my house without my cell phone if I do not have my range finder with me. Gotcha. All right. What's your biggest pet peeve? Biggest pet peeve? Other hunters not respecting another hunter. That's a very good one. Very, very good. I have seen it too many times, and that's just something that uh, I, I don't have a very good tolerance for. Okay. You meet a complete stranger. You strike up a conversation. They ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell that person? Well, you know, I do have a, a nine-to-five job, so to speak, in insurance, so it kind of depends on, on who I'm dealing with. But if it's hunting-related, you know, I tell them that I do have this, this hunting preserve in Missouri and uh, kind of talk about it, debunk any myths or, or legends or rumors they may have heard. Um, and I got into this to tell you the truth of helping other people. We've got some stuff in the pipeline um, with some charitable organizations. Hopefully we're going to do something for some wounded veterans this coming up hunting season, uh, some stuff for some uh, maybe some less fortunate kids, disabled children. Um, and there's nothing that I enjoy more than giving back. You know, I've been blessed in my life. Uh, great family, healthy kids, great job. Uh, so anything I can do to help somebody else that's what I'm for, and and that's what I strive to do every day. All right, and, very good. And instill that in my kids and keep them involved as well. Awesome. All right, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? I had actually had some cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon rolls. All right. Yeah. Definitely. All right. You you you're allowed to have your own billboard. It's a blank yep. canvas. What do you decide to put on the on the billboard? If I had a billboard, I would probably put something on there for my hunt that we're going to do. Uh, in the future, again, with some of our wounded veterans or our children, uh, just a, a big board, uh, a big billboard with all these kids or, or wounded veterans standing around with with animals that they've killed and just expressions on their faces. I don't even think you'd have to put any uh, caption on the billboard. I think that would kind of speak for itself. Gotcha. All right, you hear the word successful. Uh -huh. Who's the first person that pops into your head, and why? My grandfather. My grandfather was successful in everything he'd done because he wanted to be successful. And not only did he want to be successful, is he wanted people around him to be successful. He wanted to encourage other people to be successful. And I think that's the only way in life that we will ever be successful is sharing those opportunities with other people and making them just as successful as us. Nice. Or at least giving the tools to be successful. Very good. What's a day in the life of Chad Eubanks look like? Oh, Lord. My, my day starts fairly early. Again, I have these two, two young guys, teenagers, that's juniors in high school. Uh, so we get up about 6 o'clock every morning. We're not big breakfast buffs. They kind of get something on the way to school or they'll eat, uh, eat breakfast at school. But uh, pretty much I begin p preparing my day uh, for my regular job. And... Uh, Going out, I visit customers. I cover a pretty big territory. Gotcha. Um, fielding phone calls, clients. I've got clients all over the, the country that I, that I have uh, built rep, reputations with. Um, getting getting this hunting preserve kind of off the ground, getting some marketing uh, going with this. This is going to be our first season, and, and from everything that we're seeing right now, it's going to be a very successful year, not only for us, but for the hunters that come out. Um, Again, we have several organizations that's uh, going to get involved with us. We've got several major companies from deer stands to deer feeders, uh, binoculars, 
uh, gun farms that's getting involved with us. So, um, you know, fielding those calls from them, business as usual, I guess. Nice. All right. And what's a deer hunting day in the life of Chad Eubanks look like? Deer hunting day? <laughs> Probably about like everybody else. We get up early, especially when we have our clients. We're trying to, to cook breakfast, get them taken care of in the morning. We'll do our briefing. Big on safety. You know, that is my background, so I want to make every, sure everybody in camp safe uh, or at least thinking along those lines. Uh, no loaded firearms. You get inside a stand, safety harnesses, safety equipment, um, making sure you know what your target is, where your barrel is at all times go over our safety briefings, get them out in the stands, and, you know, just enjoy being outdoors. Enjoy watching animals, seeing animals. Uh, You know, once we do take an animal, animal, uh, get it located, we'll get it back back to the lodge, get it all processed up for them, quartered up, put it in the cooler, and everybody sat around and reflect on, on the hunt for the day. Awesome. Chad, this has been a pleasure have you on our show. I've learned a lot tonight, stuff I, we have not ever discussed, and you've opened my eyes to an aspect of hunting that really gets bashed pretty hard in the hunting community. But, You're right. Uh, I think you've you've made some very, very good points about why it should be around. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. I do want to throw out one thing. We just created a Facebook page about two weeks ago. It's Bone Buster Outdoors. You can find us on Facebook. Nice. We're in the process of getting our website off the ground. I was uh, with our marketing people today. We're putting some final touches on it. So hopefully at the end of the month we'll have that thing going live. But again, Bone Buster Outdoors. Nice. Check it out. Give us a like. Um, any uh, questions I, I have for anybody, you know, my phone number is listed on there. They can call me anytime. I, I'd be more than happy to get some people out uh, that's never been for a hunt. You know, that's that's what we're about. That's what we do. Nice. I was just about to ask you, how do we reach out to you if we have other questions after they listen to the show? And you, you're spot on. Very nice. Chad, right. thank you for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. You bet. I can't thank Chad enough for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast to talk about high fence hunting. Fascinating subject. Definitely gets beat up a lot on Facebook, on social media. People scream high fence every time they see a big deer. And certainly big deer live within high fence areas. But he makes some very, very valid, good points. Yeah, no doubt about it, Jay. It, 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 it makes you stop and think that, you know, in reality, high fence is probably a great plan for uh, a, a guy with, with children and, and trying to be safe. And it just makes sense. Yeah, there's no competition for the most part. And there's no chance of the big buck being shot from out from under you if you've been at it all season. And, you know, thinking back to some of the biggest deer that have been shot and the people we've interviewed on this show, their biggest challenge, it seems, is not so much getting to the buck or timing the pattern correctly or playing the wind on a certain day when the pressure is right. It's more about not telling a soul that you have what you have in front of you because you have them on your game cameras and hoping to God that nobody gets them before you do or somebody shows up and maybe trespasses or poaches or maybe just a neighbor hears about the buck that you're hunting, has never seen it, and goes out and kills it. I can see how this, after if that has happened multiple times, how this might be a better choice. Yeah, I agree to that. You know, not saying that it's fair game or a high fence is, you know, completely what we're recommending because that's not it. But it's definitely controllable by somebody right. that's on the high fence. Right. I, I don't think you can compare it to, you know, the, the, the typical fair chase hunt where you're on the ground, um, you're still hunting, you're in wide open territories. I don't think that's the comparison. I think the comparison is that you have a place, you want to hunt it, you can afford it, you want to introduce your children to the sport, you want to have some action that they can depend upon. And if you're not in an area for sure where there are lots of deer, this, this is probably a, a, a decent option overall. I'm not saying it's the answer, but it certainly hasn't, I, I can't r- remove it from the equation anymore. And I'm not sure I did completely before, but for sure, it's in, it's in play. It's in my playbook now. Yeah, for sure, Jay. It, it makes sense to, to have that in your playbook, no doubt about it. Yep. So, very, very cool. Thanks to Chet. So, Dusty, do we have 
a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week. Chubby Tines tip of the week is... The Chubby Tines tip of the week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. It's time to start putting your mineral out. Okay. It's the season. Fa la 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 la. That was Christmas time. Pretty much. The the deer antler growth is going to start here not too long. Some deer you may be seeing that sprout already um, on the turnaround. But, yeah, just uh, start thinking about getting your mineral lined up, getting it out in place, and uh, start getting that maximum antler, gro- antler, antler growth right off the beginning here. So you're saying that this is the time to get that mineral out. Yeah, it's definitely a time to to get the mineral sites going, freshened up, ready to roll, so that you, you get that mineral count in the system right now. So when the mantlers start pressing out, they will be at full potential. Gotcha. All right. So mineral out now. Now, what kind of minerals should we be looking at? You know, the, it just depends on, you know, your area. Uh, based on a lot of studies, every every area is a little bit different on on the mineral needs to to satisfy the nutritional value in the system of the deer. Um, you know, I, I suggest that you talk with somebody that's familiar with your mineral. Go to your your local feed stores, or you know, even Doug Strava over at Horny Buck Seed Company will answer a lot of questions on mineral. Uh, I'm I'm farthest from a mineral expert, but uh, I will note in the in my story here that it works. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, I believe everything you tell me when it comes to deer hunting, so I'm on board. Absolutely, 100%. I've decided to hold off on the deer movement forecast this at this time of year, just in case you're wondering. Normally, we would have that right about now, but I think we're going to start that in late August, just because deer season isn't happening. Didn't seem like there was a lot of interest when we were doing it, so if you're looking for it, um, hang tight. We're going to start posting those somewhere around August and hold off for the next six months or so. So that's the scoop on that. Thanks to Chad Eubanks for joining us on this show and talking about high fence hunting compared to the other types of hunting that he's done. Thanks to Jim Morse for sponsoring the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast from Morse's Sporting Goods. And thanks to Jim Snow from the Eurohanger. Uh, Just a great product there as well. Dusty, where can we find you when we're not hanging out here talking on the mic? Well, you can shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors. And also, if you want to shoot me an Instagram follow, at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Shoot me an email at jay at bigbuckregistry.com. You can always reach me through Facebook if you want to submit a, a buck to our 225,000 Facebook diehard deer hunting fans. It's uh, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash mybuck. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. We're on Instagram, uh, which is instagram.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. You can always find us on just the regular Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. And uh, again, if you'd like to donate to the show, it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate. You can always give us a call at 724-613-2825. You can either call or text that line if you'd like. So I think that's a wrap, brother. Big buck, big buck, everywhere a big buck. Very nice. Well, I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.